welcome to Koinonia. Here at Great Bridge United Methodist Church, we welcome online and in-person community, lively spiritual conversation, and personal study and reflection so that we may give our hearts and our lives to God in order to transform the world and see to it that no one misses out on the grace of God. We know that the Word of God draws us closer to one another, and that the study of God's Word is essential to our Christian walk. So let's open up our browsers and our Bibles and receive God's Word to us today. sermon series video. I love those things. Any baseball fans in here? Feels like walk-up music or something. <clears throat> we are in a new sermon series called Why Not Church? Why not church? What do we mean by why not church? Well, Jesus has risen from the dead and the tomb is empty, so why not go and declare the good news of the Lord to the masses? struck me this week, you know, we, we have found and discovered a, a lot of things. We found the, Same. Siri, um, <laughs> she, she's listening to the, ser- the sermon today, apparently. We, we, we've discovered a lot of things. We, we, we found the, the pyramid of Giza. We, we've discovered where the Titanic has wrecked. We, we even have been to the moon. We, we've discovered a lot of things. And we've spent millions and millions of dollars trying to find evidence of Jesus on earth, right, to try to find his body. That, that would be the quickest way to put an end to Christianity, to just say, nope, here's his body. Um, he didn't raise from the dead. But we haven't found him, and I don't, I don't believe we will. Allow me to make a prediction this morning. that I don't believe we're going to find the body of Jesus because he has risen. So why not tell the world, church? This Sunday, we're going to be in John chapter 20, verses 24 through 29. This is the story of Thomas. Verse 24, one of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. So they told him, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands. Put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again. And this time, Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. But blessed are those who believe without seeing me. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, if you grew up in church or, grew, or you, you run around in Christian circles, you, you've often heard this story. And when you hear this story, we have um, a description for Thomas. We, we call him Doubting Thomas. Um, however, I, I did not um, hear the story for the first time that way. And I remember hearing this story in a, in a different thing came to mind. What came to mind was a story of when I was in third grade. You see, third grade was a big deal. 
back in whatever year that was. Third grade was a big deal. It was the first year that we took SOLs in all of our classes. It was, it was a year in which you were no longer the little kids. You were now one of the big kids. And third grade was also a, a big deal because third grade is when show and tell happened. We got to have show and tell day in third grade. And Miss McKee, my teacher, she was strict, but you learned. It was her last time teaching the third grade before she would retire. And so we wanted to send her out with a bang. And so I'll never forget um, show and tell day was, it was a big deal. It was a huge deal. And I, I'll never forget what I brought to show and tell. I was um, in third grade. I was really into collecting football cards. And I would had this huge binder. And so I got up for show and tell. And we were in an auditorium kind of like this because we, we, would, we didn't even do show and tell in our classroom. We did it in the auditorium. And we were in this auditorium. And parents were invited. And I got up and I start talking about my football cards. And so after an hour and a half of talking about every Green Bay Packer player that's ever played for the Packers, my turn was over. And I'll never forget, my, my friend Robert, he went next. And Robert, um, I'd been asking him all day, what, what, do you, what did you bring for show and tell? What did you bring for show and tell? And Robert wouldn't tell me. And so he gets up on the stage, and he's got his backpack on. And Rob, <laughs> Robert takes his backpack off, and he unzips his backpack. And I kid you not, out jumps a live ferret. <clears throat> and... Um, Miss McKee, she um, great teacher, but she was not the, the best candidate to chase this ferret down. And um, us as third grade students, we were cheering this ferret on. <laughs> Let's go. It was the most exciting day of third grade. I'll never forget it. The reason why that, that story of show and tell came to my mind is as I was reading this story, when I first heard it, I thought Jesus was having show and tell with Thomas and his disciples. See, just last Sunday, and in our text just before this, Jesus has, he's died on Friday, and he's been raised to life on Sunday. And the, the other disciples, they, they see that the tomb is empty. And they're trying to tell Thomas, Thomas, G Jesus has risen, Jesus has risen. And like many of us, Thomas goes, I, I will not believe it unless I see it. You ever heard someone say that? I will not believe it unless I see it. So this is what Thomas says, and so they're in an upper room, and Jesus appears to them. So suddenly, Jesus was standing amongst them as he was before. But he wasn't as he totally was before because he had, was bearing the wounds still of the cross. And so Thomas, there full of doubt, Jesus appears and he tells Thomas, come, come to me. Bring those doubts to me. Let me settle your heart. But while Jesus gives Thomas what he wants... He doesn't exactly do it the way Thomas would like. Jesus inverts the order on Thomas. He changes it up on Thomas. You see, Thomas, in the story, first asked to see and then to feel. He says it like this. I will not believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. He wanted to see with his eyes Jesus and then feel the wound for himself. But Jesus shows up and changes it on him. Jesus says to him, Thomas, put your finger here and look at my side. Thomas asked to see and then feel, but Jesus asked Thomas to feel and then see. Why is that significant? I think that's true for our lives as well. That oftentimes, we're, we're so, stuck up, so, so stuck on seeing that we don't take time to feel the weight of Jesus in our lives. It's easy for me to point out and see how God is working in other people's lives. How God is working in other people's marriages. Or how God's working in the lives of other people's kids. They look so neat and put together. But yet at the same time, while I can see that in other people's lives, I can also feel Nothing for myself. We can see without feeling. But I believe that if we're able to do what Jesus tasked Thomas with, which is to feel, then we'll catch a vision and be able to see what God's grace and everyone else's life looks like around us. If we're able to feel Jesus in our own heart, we'll be able to see it all around us. It gives us a new spiritual lens 
that we might see the world differently through. So there's two, there's two lessons here. One of the things I love about Jesus is he includes everybody in the room. Obviously, the first lesson being for Thomas. That Thomas, I, I, I know that despite having seen me do all the miracles and despite the fact that I've risen from the grave, you still have doubts. And praise God that God in our doubt, in Thomas's doubt, is not frustrated. He's not annoyed with Thomas. Though he'd given Thomas plenty of evidence that he truly was the son of God, Thomas still doubted, but Jesus entreats Thomas. Thomas, come to me. Let me show you that you might believe. But I also believe it was a lesson for the other disciples in the room. I thought to myself a lot this week, what, what were the other disciples thinking? What was going through their mind as they're in this room and, and they, they want their friend Thomas so badly to believe in Jesus, but yet Thomas is, is doubting. I wonder if when Jesus showed up, the other disciples stood back and were like, we, we believe it's, it's Thomas with the issue. Thomas is the one, Jesus, that, that doesn't believe. Or I wonder if it was excitement in their hearts that, that they wanted Thomas to believe so badly, and now this was the opportunity in which Thomas would have his doubts settled. I don't know what was going through their minds, but I do believe Jesus was teaching a, deci- a lesson to his other disciples in the room that day. You see, Jesus knew that the world would struggle with doubt. Doubt is our story, from the beginning of the book to the end of the book, right? If you think about it, in the garden, Adam and Eve, everything's perfect. Everything they need is, is there, and, and Adam and Eve begin to doubt God's goodness for them, begin to doubt the plan God has for them, and so they turn and they decide to eat of the forbidden fruit. All throughout the story of Exodus, which follows, it's a story of God's people being in a place of belief and then doubting God and turning away. Then God turns them back. It's believe and then doubt, believe and then doubt. That's what all last week was, the Passion Week. We love to talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and rightfully so. But what makes the resurrection good news is what's leading up to it. A week full of the disciples who had a privilege that you and I did not have, the privilege to live with Jesus, the, the privilege to be able to see him tear the, the loaves of bread and the fish and to bless thousands of people, to heal leprosy, to perform these miracles. They, they saw it with their own eyes, and yet when the time had come, they were overcome with doubt. I relate a lot to Peter. Peter in the Bible, he, he's the, the courageous one, the go-getter that Jesus, I, I'm, if you die, I shall die with you. I will die for the cause, and Jesus looks back at him and says, before the rooster crows in the morning, you'll deny me three times. I too, myself, would love to believe that if Jesus was here today, I'd be the first one to stand up for Jesus. But I believe I'd be like Thomas, with doubt, denying Jesus. Think about Judas, one of his disciples, who betrays him with a kiss for silver. And then, the crowds that chant, crucify him, crucify him. The same crowds that have been following him around, seeing what he had been doing, or chanting, crucify him. And then he dies and he raises from the dead. And not just eight days later, one of the disciples are here now. Though Jesus had told them, hey, this is what's coming. I'm going to die and I'm going to raise on the third day. Just eight days later, one of his disciples are now doubting him again. Our story is a story of doubt. It was in the Bible, and I believe it's true for us today that we're gonna find ourselves in seasons where believing feels like breathing. And then we're gonna find ourselves in seasons where doubt floods our hearts. It blocks our mind, covers our eyes from being able to see the goodness of God in our lives. It's belief and doubt, belief and doubt. That's why the cross is good news, that despite us, despite the fact that we would doubt Jesus still went to the cross, and Jesus rose from the dead, thus making our salvation not a last weekend thing. Our salvation is not an Easter event, it's not a past event, but it's a present and future event as well. That all throughout our lives, we're, we're on this journey of constantly God saving us from our doubts, our unbeliefs, from our sins. That's good news this morning. 
So I asked the church this question today. How can the church become a place where we listen, we offer ourselves, and we help others overcome so that all might believe? It's a hefty Hefty task if you try to answer that question. How are we to be a people that live in the world in such a way that we might show and tell Jesus to people and they would believe? We can easily begin to slip into this is a burden that's on us, but it's never been about us. Rather, we get to stand as inadequate people, people that also are wrestling with doubt and questioning who the Lord is at times. And we get to say to the individual, our neighbor, have you heard about Jesus? To which, if your story goes much like mine, they often reply, well, I I don't really go to church because I don't necessarily know if I believe. And we get to respond, if you struggle with doubt, this place is for you. There's room for doubt in this room. There was room for doubt in that upper room For Thomas, there's room today in the church for those who are struggling with doubt and unbelief. So we share Jesus with others. But as I was reading this this week, it it went a lot like how it goes for me when I try to share Jesus with others. Listen to this. Tell me this doesn't sound like something you may have heard if you've shared the good news of Jesus with somebody. It says, one of the 12 disciples, Thomas, was not with the others when Jesus came. So Jesus has come to the other disciples. Thomas is not there. And so they want to go and tell Thomas the good news of Jesus, right? That's many of our stories in this room that God has showed up in our lives and now we want to share it with other people. They told him, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands and put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. Does that not sound like, hey, you you should come to church? Well, no, 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 no. I, I don't know if I believe, right? It reads just as our story often goes today. But the good news is this, is that in our hypocrisy, in our doubt, he loves us. I wrote it in my notes like this. As persistent as we are in our doubt, he is even more persistent in his love. The Bible says that where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So what's our story? Our story is that... We are a broken people who have a savior who invites us to bring our doubts unto him. We may leave Easter last weekend filled up, full of hope, and you got to Monday and Monday crashed your faith. There's good news. Jesus knew that would happen. Jesus is still pursuing you. He's persistent in your doubt. And what an invitation to extend to the world. That hey, it's not that we have it all together. It's not that we're, we may look neat on the inside, but the broken is on the inside. We're broken. And our Savior loves us and pursues us. So if you'll allow me for just a second to be childish, at Easter, God gave you and I something that is worth having show and tell with the world. I'll say it again. At Easter, God gave us something that is worth having show and tell with the world. But maybe before we start with the world, we should start with our neighbor. It's worth showing and telling. I love this idea of showing and telling. This idea that sometimes our actions speak so loud that they can't hear the words that are coming out of our mouths. That we live in a world with, by the way in which we live, the circles in which we travel in, we show the mercy of Jesus by how we live. But there often often comes a time, too, where we tell of the good news of Jesus. I know the opportunity is never perfect, You've probably been in the the room before when you've thought to yourself, gosh, I would love to bring up Jesus right now, but things might get weird. They might, but it's worth telling the good news because he is risen. The invitation we extend is, hey, you have doubts about God? We do too. In fact, even his closest followers when he was alive doubted him the the whole way. If they had doubts when Jesus was alive, how much more will you and I struggle with doubt? But bring him to Jesus and watch the Lord reveal himself to them like he did us. As we begin to close here, the interaction between the other disciples and Jesus is this. They try to tell Thomas about Jesus. They try to proclaim the good news. And Thomas makes a request that they're inadequate to fulfill. 
I'll only believe if I see it. I'll only believe if I can put my hand into his side. Oftentimes, you and I are inadequate to tell people about Jesus. But in that inadequacy, I think Jesus shows up just like he did for the disciples and Thomas. Like Jesus knew the disciples wouldn't have all the answers for Thomas, and so Christ himself appears before Thomas. Gosh, if we're just willing to, to say, hey, we, we don't have all the answers, but we, we want to tell you about this guy, Jesus, I believe the Lord will intercede on our behalf and make Jesus known to the hearts of those that we bring to him. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart, you're the one that guides my heart, Lord, I need you. Jesus, you're my.